So I would like to introduce Brooks Keen from CARE. He is going to be leading this session. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we've had a very interesting day, um, and I'm excited to see where the conversations from this session uh, will take us, given all the background that we've all absorbed throughout the day. Um, particularly from that third session and a lot of the questions that it raises around political will and, and, uh, and functionality of institutions and uh, all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, first of all, let me, uh, let me introduce uh, the panel that we have today and then I'm going to give a few opening remarks uh, to lead it off. Um, first off, we're going to have Peter Lockery. Uh, Peter is the director of CARES Water Team. Um, but he has uh, a nefarious and varied past. So uh, he's worked in the private sector, uh, <laughs> and he's also worked for the World Bank Water and Sanitation Program. Uh, so he's he's in, on familiar territory. So he's he's coming at this from a lot of perspectives, um, and he's also involved in quite a number of partnerships since that's a core component of the next. Uh, the next session that we're going to talk about. So he's uh, on the board or steering committee of um, building partnerships for development in water and sanitation, the Millennium Water Alliance, and uh, WASH Advocates. Um, then second, we're going to have Katie Carroll. Katie is the coordinator of the global uh, public-private partnership uh, for hand washing. And, um, Having lived in Kenya for a couple of years as this was starting up, I can tell you that it already had, even uh, three or four years ago, it had a lot of momentum already. And, um, and it's, I'm fascinated to hear uh, you know, how they got that much momentum and, uh, and how it's built even larger since. Um, and third, we're going to have uh, Dr. Greg Allgood, who is the director of the uh, Children's Safe Drinking Water Program um, at Pro Procter & Gamble. He also chairs the advocacy and communications group of the World Health Organization's uh, network to promote uh, household water treatment and safe storage. And uh, lastly, we'll hear from uh, Darren Saywell, who you've seen already today, uh, but he's going to put on a different hat. So uh, he's, he's had on his plan hat earlier, but now he's going to put on his sanitation and water for all hat. He's the vice chair of the sanitation and water for all partnership. Um, and I'll, I'll leave that to him to describe. Um, so let me just, uh, and, and I, I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm a policy advisor on CARES Water Team, so I work with Peter. Um, and I work on advocacy and governance issues, so that's the direction that, you know, that I sort of start looking at things from. So um, you'll probably see that flavored in my remarks. Um, so I think what we're going to try and do in this session is really start uh, pushing things out to the big picture. I mean, we've, we've already had uh, several people who've, who've been looking at some big picture issues, like the wash cost uh, folks, um, at a very, in a very analytical way. Um, but we really want you all, if, you know, some of you will look at the big picture on a day-to-day -day basis, some of you don't. But even if you don't, even if you work with, uh, with two or three communities or, or two or three schools on wash issues, uh, or you work on a specific technology, we're going to invite you now to, to try and imagine uh, the, the big picture and, uh, and, and think about questions uh, at national scales. Think long term, which is a theme we've had running throughout this day, sustainability. Um, we hear quite, a, quite frequently, I hear, in this sector that, that the solutions are simple or that we know the solutions. Um, and I, I actually want to push back on that a little bit. Uh, I, I think that we've talked a lot about low sustainability issues. Uh, we know that, that quite a few uh, water points are not sustainable. We know there are huge issues with, um, with setting up sanitation uh, businesses. We know there are, are uh, supply chain issues. There's all sorts of uh, problems. We have aid dependency. Um, and I want to say that I think actually this is a very complex sector. Um, there are issues of uh, building political will, changing norms, changing cultures, businesses and entrepreneurship, learning and research. And because of that, everything has to be on the table. We need everyone around that table and everything has to be on it. Um, we need 
at the core of it, all of these efforts are going to be funded either by the public sector or the private sector. Um, the public sector, it's going to necessitate working with government, which we know is time consuming. It's difficult to do. It doesn't often fit in our sort of donor timelines, but it's something that we know we have to do. In terms of the private sector, we're going to hear from, uh, from Procter & Gamble today. Um, what can we learn from, from their long experience trying to commercialize a product uh, that uh, helps uh, give safe water to the base of the pyramid? What lessons can, can the, the broader efforts of spurring private sector uh, learn, get from that? Um, there's a bunch of supporting actors. There's people from NGOs like me, there's, there's academics, there's uh, development banks and funders, and yes, I'm putting even people who give hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to, to sectors in a country as supporting actors, because that's ultimately not the institutions that, that uh, are the service deliverers. Um, and then there's a variety of other kinds of funders like professional foundations. So uh, I, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it, let, it, let us kick it off and uh, turn it over to Peter to lead off the discussion. Thank you, Brooks. Um, you know, I'm under instruction uh, now, and so the first instruction was that I had to mention uh, everyone forever, so I've done that. <laughs> uh, well, Brooks told me I was nefarious, so I have to live up to my reputation. Um, the second instruction is from my team about what I can and can't say, and I, I'll no doubt be lectured by Brooks after this, but anyway, here goes. Um, and before I start, when I talk about we, think about it as a sort of collective, because you know, care doesn't work alone. In fact, we very, very rarely work alone. We work in partnerships, in a range of different partnerships. So the we is always a sort of collective we. So the story starts for me in this very auditorium, uh, the World Bank's Community Water and Sanitation Conference, which I think was in 1996 or 1998. Anybody attend that conference? Okay. Um, on the flight back to uh, Peru from that conference, one of, a do one of our donors and one of my colleagues designed a demand-driven water supply and sanitation program based on what they'd heard at the Community Water and Sanitation uh, Conference. That brought together central government, municipalities, communities, the private sector, and academia in a way that was revolutionary for us. Because we, the international NGO, were no longer implementers, but facilitators of and advocates to national and local players. How I knew that this uh, program was doing something different was that annual review meetings were standing room only with farmers, mayors, and folks from the Social Investment Fund, plus many others vying for attention. Fast forward five years, and my colleague and I were working on an application of the same approach in Ethiopia. Only this time, working at scale, had been interpreters reaching out to half the districts in Ethiopia, rather than focusing on a more limited number of districts to achieve high levels of coverage. You can imagine the logistical issues, including training, that faced the government. In addition, the levels of investment in each district were insufficient to fully engage civil society, the private sector, and most importantly, the district administrations. We resolved to do things differently. When we accessed some resources, we supported one district, and then gradually over eight, eight years supported an additional four districts in the same zone with the goal of achieving high levels of coverage or full coverage. So what have been the results? Two of the districts are well beyond 70% coverage, and they started from very low levels as those of you who've uh, worked in uh, Ethiopia will know, uh, sort of five years ago, coverage levels were uniformly very low indeed. The districts plan on the basis of water point mapping and knowledge of water point functionality. So it's not impossible, or it's not possible to ignore slippage. I just learned that word a few minutes ago, so I thought I'd slip it in. Uh, functionality is around 80%. 
and strongly linked to governance in terms of transparency, accountability, inclusiveness, and participation. In other words, we can pretty much predict the functionality from knowing uh, about uh, governance. And it's not dependent on age. Age is not one of the, you can't draw any conclusions from the age of a system, at least uh, in this zone in Ethiopia. Uh, local contributions to installation as well as operation and maintenance of water systems have gradually increased, as has the involvement of the private sector. Just as in Peru, there is a momentum which is beyond we, what we, the outside facilitators, can generate. It's still an NGO program, but local ownership is growing. What are the lessons we've learned from all this? As Ned Breslin has proposed, the water for people have ably demonstrated elsewhere. We should be setting collective goals and forming partnership across NGOs, donors, governments, private sector, and academia to reach them. As Ned has pointed out, this is the way that the polio and guinea worm eradication programs have achieved success. We need to get beyond a projectized approach centered on outputs and access and build long-term programmatic approaches that work at scale even if they're only working in a relatively small defined area, geographic area, and focus on increasing coverage while at the same time sustaining functionality. And I'm really repeating the, uh, the last session here. Uh, to do this, we need, or rather the managers at local level, need long-term monitoring systems and also research that tells them about the key elements such as good governance that need to be in place to maintain functionality. We also conclude that sustainable solutions will be rooted in the public or the private sector, where citizens have agency, either through governance mechanisms or as customers, and where funding flows are not totally dependent on donors. We also conclude that as NGOs, direct service delivery may not get us long-term sustainable solutions. How much effort do we need to invest in advocacy? Fellow NGOs, think about what I'm saying. Think about getting out of our comfort zones of service delivery projects and thinking about what are we advocating for in this particular program? For example, we've been working on a wash in schools program in Western Kenya. It's a partnership focused on research, national advocacy, and long-term outcomes. The national advocacy has resulted in changes in government budget lines that will keep school facilities nationwide working long after the project ends. Reality is we haven't quite got to that point, but we have seen a doubling of uh, the funds that are made available to schools uh, per student each year for operation and maintenance of uh, wash facilities. Now I will talk about care. The debate rages within care about where the balance should be between time spent on service delivery and time spent on research, policy, and advocacy. Of course, it has to be a balance. And it probably um, depends on the context. But I challenge all the NGOs in this room to think about, do you have the right balance between your service delivery programs and the other pieces of work where you're doing research policy, looking, looking at policy and, and advocating for either changes in policy or changes in the way that policy is implemented? We really need to think very hard about this. Otherwise, there's a possibility that we, the international NGOs, are going to become irrelevant in a few years' time. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Um, thank you for the introduction, Brooks, but I'm kind of offended you didn't say I was nefarious as well. So I have a checkered past. Anyway, <laughs> in hand washing. Um, so I'm with the Global Partnership for Hand Washing, and we have. Um, 14 organizations in our partnership. They are very different. We have academic institutions, private sector, donors, NGOs, the gamut. Um, 
We all share the same goal, which is hand-washing behavior change, but we have very different ways of approaching that goal um, and accomplishing that goal. Our private sector partners, for example, Procter & Gamble um, and Unilever and Colgate-Palmolive, they do a lot of marketing campaigns, a lot of mass media communications, while we also have you know, donors who may, maybe the majority of their approach focuses on community-based, school-based interventions. So, very different approaches to um, achieving the same goal. And to be honest, you know, the differences make it difficult to come up with activities that everyone wants to do together. I think that's one of the biggest challenges I have as a coordinator of the partnership is trying to find things that really um, ignite all of my partners and that all of them see value in and see that working together with the other partners is gonna be more effective than if they did this activity on their own. So that's a, a common challenge that we face in the partnership. Um, and I thought it might be useful to highlight one amazing success we've had, one activity we did choose that has been very successful, and talk about the factors of why it was successful. Um, and then I'm going to put out a challenge to all of you as well. Um, obviously, that great success is Global Handwashing Day, and I mentioned this morning it's celebrated by over 200 million people in 100 countries, over a million schools are involved. Um, it grows, it grows each year since this is going to be the fifth year of Global Handwashing Day. Every year it gets bigger with very little um, coordination or direction from a global level. It really has a grassroots um, uh, movement to it. And I think there's three factors of success for this that um, may be applicable to other partnerships. One is obviously we have a common goal or initiative, which is Global Handwashing Day. Um, and everyone can contribute to it, everyone. Um, everyone's activities that they do is part of this bigger global um, activity. And I think people really respond to that. They like to be part of something bigger and feel that they're contributing to something that's going to have a larger impact than just their individual uh, activities. And I think the second factor of success is the fact that every partner can buy into it. Um, no matter what your approach is, all of my partners have very different approaches to hand washing behavior changes, I said they can all use their approach when they're celebrating Global Hand Washing Day. So our private sector partners can do a commercial around Global Hand Washing Day. They can do thing in the marketing um, efforts in the stores with their products. Um, our partners who are working in schools can have activities with the schools and the children. It really provides a venue for everybody to participate in ways that they're already accustomed to, to doing the work of hand, of hand washing behavior change. Um, and three, I think, it. Global Handwashing Day resonates. It resonates with individuals outside of our partnership. So it doesn't just have to be our partners that are promoting that day and the messages of that day. And in fact, you know, our partners did a great deal to get the word out and really get it celebrated at a large scale. But now we've got hundreds of people contacting us every year saying, I want to participate. How do I celebrate? And we're talking about an individual teacher in a rural village who says, I want my school to be part of this, you know, a big global celebration. And so because it resonates with everybody, outside, even outside of the partnership, it really provides a venue to grow and expand um, without having to do anything on our part to, to do that. Um, it also leads to, I mean, a lot of people, I think, are a little bit critical of the days and Global Handwashing Day because it's just a day and then what happens afterwards. But you really see it being used as a tool of our partners who are working on longer term efforts. They can use Global Handwashing Day to help those efforts become more sustainable. And to give you an example, in the Philippines, you had a group uh, of NGOs, donors, private sector that were working to get handwashing as part of school curriculum, as group handwashing every day, twice a day before meals. And they wanted to make to get that embedded in all schools throughout the Philippines. And they use Global Handwashing Day as a day to announce an MOU between government agencies to announce a new policy on handwashing. And if you didn't have that day and the exposure of that day and the, you know, the platform for the government to really show what they're doing and show leadership in this area, um, you know, maybe the MOU would have been done, but it really was a great tool for that program. And you see Global Handwashing Day now often being the launching point for longer term handwashing activities in schools and communities. So I think it might have just started out as a day, but it certainly is not just a day anymore, and it, it's a great um, opportunity for longer term sustainability. So I'm trying to make this really short. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to share those three success factors and thinking about the wash sector as a whole. 
um, looking at the partnerships we do have or thinking about partnerships we could have, areas, as Peter was saying, where we could come together as a sector, um, I think the real challenge is finding that something that we can do together that resonates with everyone, that fits into their, their own work that they're doing daily, um, and that is going to be more impactful than something they could just do on their own. So that would be my challenge for the group uh, in the discussion is to just think about what could we actually, I mean, it's great to say we're in a partnership, but what do you actually do in that partnership and what's the impact of it that we could have as a sector? Hello, I'm Greg Allgood. Nice to see so many friends and colleagues I've worked with for so many years. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a different perspective since I'm with the private sector. Talk about some of our, our successes and, and our challenges in forming public-private partnerships uh, as part of our P&G Children's Safe Drinking Water Program. Now, um, I know John will be disappointed that I'm not doing a, a demonstration of the pure, pure package today, but we're not talking about the technology as much as about the partnerships. And I know many of you have seen the magic of when we take dirty water and make it clean. But if you want to see that, talk to me later and I'll do that for you. Instead, we're going to focus on the partnerships that, that we've had in, in providing 4.5 billion liters of, of clean drinking water uh, over the la uh, since 2004. And so what I'll be talking about is more about water quality. Then I know a lot of your discussions so far have been about, about water access, but uh, I'll, I'll focus on water quality. Our work on partnerships really began in earnest in 2004 when P&G formed uh, a Safe Drinking Water Alliance with USAID, CARE, PSI, and, and um, Johns Hopkins Center for Communications programs. And what we wanted to do was test several different models. One was a purely commercial model where P&G was selling our water purification packets, like we sell soap and shampoo and other products. One was a, a new model, brand new model for us of social marketing. So working with a, an NGO to market one of our products in a place where we didn't have a presence. And the last was uh, looking at emergency relief, again, an area where we not, had not really had experience in selling products, but looking at, at that as a model. Um, so what did we learn from that? Well, when P&G led the commercial marketing model, we found that people really liked our product, but when we invested to reach the people in far rural areas, like this woman in Guatemala, um, we, recre we created a big financial hurdle for ourselves because we did not have an existing infrastructure to reach people like the, the woman in Guatemala. And so we determined that we couldn't move forwards with that, with that model. But instead of stopping, we st instead focused on the other models, the social marketing and, and the emergency relief. And I'll dig a little bit deeper in, into each of those, starting with the social marketing. So this is really, it's, it's an alternative or a complementary approach of us doing it ourselves. Instead, we're working with social marketing companies. Uh, much of our work is done with, with PSI, uh, the largest social marketing company, where they uh, sell our product, do their behavior change uh, efforts, and then work through um, the commercial sector to provide it. Uh, many times this involves things like women to women selling. In fact, I was just in, in South Sudan where, where I took this picture of, of women who set up near the Nile in a market, do the water purification demonstrations, and then they have a brisk business in, in selling the packets and, and making a profit. Uh, sometimes it, and when it's done best, is integrated with other community efforts. Uh, we've worked with World Vision, uh, with CARE and others to do school programs. Uh, CDC has monitored those school programs and shown that, um, for one thing, they reduce school absenteeism. Uh, and the CDC study showed a 26% decrease in school absenteeism, but also showed that it dramatically increased use of water purification products in the community. In this case, it was a threefold increase, and not just of our packets, but also of, of other uh, products that, that were out there. The other thing that we found is that while we were not successful in commercially selling the packets ourselves, we have seen that when we create these new distribution systems, they are able to sell other P&G products successfully, which is a new, whole new distribution for us to reach low-income consumers. And it provides enough of a critical mass for women to women selling to have a profitable business, a sustainable business. For, so for example, there's a group that many of you know that were part of the Swash Plus effort, the Safe Water and AIDS program in Kenya. Um, you know, they're selling water purification products, but now they're also selling disposable diapers. They're selling feminine hygiene products that P&G makes, and uh, even selling our, our detergent. And, and, and that's becoming a bigger and bigger part of their income. Living Goods in Uganda is doing the same thing. In fact, it's a, a big part of the income of the women who are selling. So we've learned about reaching low-income consumers through, through this effort. 
The other thing we've learned is that when the effort is done best, it's integrated. And there's lots of ways you can integrate. But because of time, I'll just focus on one specific example. And that's integrating with uh, prevention and care of HIV AIDS, which of course is the biggest funded global health uh, initiative. And this is really important because you can make the care and treatment of a person with HIV AIDS more clinically effective if you provide safe drinking water. If you have persistent diarrhea, you will not properly absorb antiretrovirals. There's published data showing that. Conversely, if you, if you give safe drinking water, you can prevent diarrhea, uh, the persistent diarrhea that occur, occurs in a person with HIV AIDS and, and significantly improve, improve their life. Um, it's also very cost effective to provide safe drinking water to people living with AIDS. Our water purification product is one of the more expensive water purification products, but it's still 50 times less than the care it takes for a person with HIV AIDS per day. So you can provide safe drinking water with the water purification packets, all costs inclusive for only two pennies, yet antiretroviral therapy costs about a dollar a day or more. And we've seen very interestingly by providing water purification products in a clinic, you can drive people to the clinic. You can get people coming back to take their antiretroviral care. Um, and many times there's a big drop off, for example, in a, a preventing to mother child transmission program. After a woman delivers, she has less motivation to go to the clinic. We've measured that by providing water pur purification products that do not have a stigma, women will come back. Because of this, we're scaling up these programs, and it's been a large part of, of the efforts to, to reach, reach scale in our efforts. Because this is so important, I wanted to give one example, uh, a real world example of a of a man called Bashir. He was reached in a, a program in Uganda by the group Keep a Child Alive. That's Alicia Keys uh, is known to, to support that charity. Um, and specifically in Uganda, it's Alive Medical Services. Bashir presented with uh, Giardia. He had persistent diarrhea caused by Giardia, a chlorine resistant parasite. Um, and so um, because he had persistent diarrhea and was so critical, he was bedridden. So he couldn't keep a job. Uh, he has six kids and his, uh, he didn't have any income, so the kids didn't have school fees, so the kids were not in school. Live medical services provided him nutrition care, provided him the PNG water purification packets, uh, and they provided antiretroviral therapy, and this is him six months later. It's one of more than 100 examples that we have of people who see dramatic life-saving benefits when you can give them uh, clean drinking water along with, with traditional um, care. So Bashir has not had uh, problems with Giardia for the last six months. Uh, he has a job now. He works in a motorcycle repair shop. And so he has income and his six kids are, kids are back in school. The last area that we, we mentioned is emergency relief. Um, when we first did our Safe Drinking Water Alliance, CARE provided the water purification packets, not in an acute emergency, but more of a chronic emergency, which was actually providing nutrition plus safe drinking water in the Horn of Africa. Well, that sounds familiar. That was in 2004. Of course, we still have the, the huge crisis now. We've learned more and more about providing uh, water purification packets for emergencies. We worked after the tsunami and, and worked with a lot, of, a lot of you to develop standard operating procedures and training of trainer materials. Um, we've learned that people need to be shown how to use the products, to use them correctly. But if that simple demonstrations are done, they can use it correctly. We're now back in the Horn of Africa. Um, and this picture was taken from, from there in, in December. We're working with PSI to provide a supply chain and the trainer-trainer efforts to reach two million people in the Horn of Africa. And the on-the-ground efforts deep in rural communities are, are mostly being done by uh, Save the Children, a CARE, Global Medic, AmeriCares, and, and others. Um, and it's making a huge difference. In six weeks, we were seeing kids who, you know, you measure the severe malnutrition with the, the, the mid-arm uh, circumference with a tape, and if you get red, they're severely malnourished. In six weeks, a lot of the kids were going to green, which means they're no longer at, at grave risk. Um, a day of the standard care for, for a severely mal mal malnourished kid of Plumpy Nut costs 40 times more than a day of, 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 of clean drinking water. So for the same amount of money for your nutrition program, if you provide nutrition therapy plus safe drinking water, Kids get better faster, you can reach more kids. It just makes a lot of sense. Another way to integrate our approaches. Um, I've mentioned that we've now provided four and a half billion liters of clean drinking water. This just shows the, um, the graph of the number of packets that we've provided uh, every year. Each packet provides 10 liters of water. So last year we were up to 137 million packets. Um, when we were doing it commercially before 2004, we were doing less than a million a year. So you can see it's, it's had tremendous growth. We will do much more. Pretty recently, the company committed to grow the program in the next few years to provide at least 200 million uh, liters of um, 
200 million packets uh, uh, a year, uh, which is 2 billion liters. Uh, and to do that, we have to build a new manufacturing plant that we're doing. The company, during the middle of the recession, invested in, in building a, a new plant for this effort because we see the benefit. And then we also did something that may, you may not have heard of. Uh, we've changed from calling it pure to now we're going to call the packets PNG. So we'll have PNG water purification packets, which is a real symbol of a uh, tangible example of PNG's commitment to this program and our commitment to our partners who are providing the packets and really are, are having all the, the on the ground impact. Uh, so for the first time in more than 100 years, we've, we've put our company's name on a, on a product. So with that, I'll stop and I thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Brooks. <clears throat> um, as, uh, as Brooks explained, um, I'm, uh, whilst my day job is with Plan International USA, I'm actually speaking with a, with a different hat on. Uh, so my, uh, my nighttime job is with uh, Sanitation and Water for All, um, of which I'm, I'm currently vice chair. Um, SWA is, for those of you who don't know, is a, a partnership of um, developing country governments, uh, donors, civil society and multilateral uh, organizations. Um, and the aim, is, uh, the aim is to ensure all, uh, all people have access to basic sanitation and, and water. I guess uh, you know, we've heard a lot about uh, Water for People's uh, Everyone Forever and uh, similar message, I guess. The, the wider concern within SWA is to maintain a focus on those countries where the needs are greatest. So it's, uh, it's off-track countries in, as, a, as a particular focal point. Um, I, it, it, the, the notes I'm going to uh, uh, recount for you, I, I see a lot of consensus with what Katie was, was saying, and so there may be a little bit of repetition here, but hopefully that, that helps to, to underline some, some points. Within SWA, there are, there are currently 82 partners, uh, and that's, that's a lot of transaction costs uh, to, to get through. Um, 38 developing country governments, uh, seven donors, three development banks, uh, four civil society networks, nine research and learning organizations, and 13 other partners that we couldn't find a category for. Um, so you can imagine that's, that's quite a lot of accommodation of different perspectives on, on the same, same issue. And the partnership seeks to do three things, and I'll quickly mention those, and then I'll talk about some of the factors for what we find is working at the moment. Um, the partnership does three things. It's, it, it aims to um, increase political prioritization for sustainable sanitation and drinking water. Um, and it does that primarily through focusing on high-level meeting, which brings together, you know, one of, one of the things we've been talking about today, how do, how do we get access to ministers of finance? So it brings together ministers of finance with ministers of water or sanitation or environment or local authority, whoever has responsibility for sanitation to begin to raise awareness about respective agendas between those two constituencies. That's the first thing. The second thing is it supports um, other organizations in marshalling the evidence base uh, for uh, advocacy for sanitation and, and water. So it works with the Glass Report, with the JMP, with, with others to bring those messages into that high level meeting. And the third thing it does, um, if the first two elements are more upstream, the, the third element is downstream. Uh, the third item is supporting national planning processes uh, and as a partnership providing technical support or catalytic seed funding as a way to, to uh, unblock the, bot uh, the bottlenecks uh, for more effective and optimal planning for, for sanitation and water at the national level. So that's what SWA does. The, the, the several factors of, of what works here, I, I think, are, are relevant. Um, you know, my guru on, on partnership development is, is Ken Kaplan at uh, building, building Partnerships for Development. And to misquote him terribly, he, I think he said one of the things was, uh, form a partnership to do the things you cannot do alone. I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's one of the key drivers for maintaining um, coherence amongst a very broad set of actors in, in partnerships. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that context has been key for SWA. It emerged out of the back of the 2008 year of sanitation. So there was already a willingness to come together around a collective agenda. And so we piggybacked on that. And I think that's been one of the things that has helped drive momentum for this partnership. 
I think the third area is flexibility in the partnership. So the willingness to accommodate a, a wide variety of perspectives and to work through potential points of conflict between those different constituents has been a key thing. Aligning around uh, a small number of key actions or aims, the three that I mentioned, um, and to look at the comparative advantage of that partnership in relation to others. So complement rather than to duplicate. There are some results that we have. Attribution is always very difficult to, to, to come to with partnership development, and I think that's one of the things to consider if you move into partnerships. Um, but I guess my parting comment would be, um, you know, partnerships have been a buzzword in the sector for, for years, a little bit like the strive for sustainability. Um, but the science behind it, or the dynamic behind it, is much more involved. There are significant transaction costs involved in partnership development, and there are significant gains. But I guess my message is, you know, you don't step into these things lightly, and they take a lot of work uh, and a lot of, uh, a lot of tending. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. Um, so uh, we're going to have a few minutes for questions now um, before we wrap up. But um, I just want to uh, take the uh, take the opportunity to ask just a, just a couple of uh, of questions to lead off. Um, so building off of of what Peter said about um, about being in a projectized approach at the moment. Um, these, these movements through partnerships like uh, the hand washing partnership, like SWA, uh, where we're trying to get beyond that. How can we, what, what, are the, um, what are the sectoral and institutional incentives and behaviors that we need to change? Especially uh, maybe directed at NGOs, since we have a room full of NGOs. What are the institutional uh, behaviors and incentives that we need to change or fix in order to, to more successfully get to that next level where we can come together around collective goals. I'll throw it to anybody who wants to answer. Go ahead. Yeah. So one of, the th is one of the things that I think we can do better of is, is integration. And, and for example, the, the WASH group separate from the, the health group, separate from the nutrition group, and creates and a lot of the groups I work with, some, some walls between those groups that are sort of hard to overcome and, and make, um, make integration more difficult. In the field, it's not really that difficult to provide, uh, particularly when we're talking about water quality. Uh, I mentioned the Bashir example. Alive Medical Services gives food. They show a demonstration of the packets. They provide them at the same time that people come in to get their antiretroviral drugs. So that's very simple because they're small. But if you look at a, you know, an intergovernmental agency or an NGO, you know, to do that within, for example, UNICEF is very difficult. You know, it's very, on the ground, it's very simple. But that would be nutrition, wash, and, and HIV/AIDS care. So somehow we have to figure out how to break down those walls so we can the people that need all three things or four things they can get it. I think we should stop thinking about first-time access as uh, one of the goals, and we have uh, donors uh, pushing us in that direction. Uh, in fact, we have um, the U.S. Congress uh, interested in uh, how many people we have provided first-time access to. It's a, an incentive that's uh, driving us in the wrong direction, uh, as has been uh, you know, ably demonstrated this afternoon. And uh, we need to start thinking about uh, sort of much smarter indicators and come up with, uh, you know, a very limited number of indicators that we actually all agree on. Is there any other sector that uh, can't agree on indicators? I guess I would just add, uh, building off both comments, is I think there needs to be space and opportunity for the sector to come together to have these conversations. I think having this today is wonderful, and I think, you know, we always get so busy in what our project is doing or my partnership is doing, and I learn so much when I come and talk to others that are working on water, that are working on sanitation. Um, and 
to me, in, in my mind, it's, it's wonderful to have that opportunity and to have some actually facilitated discussion among all the, the actors to say, you know, what's, what's, what are the trends here and where are there opportunities for all of us to, like, like Peter was saying, you know, the indicators, you know, why can't we come together and work on an issue like that? Uh, my my uh, building off that, I think my comment would be it's about institutional egos. We need to set those institutional egos aside in order to, to enter into a partnership that allows for more effective uh, activity on the ground. And, and some of us have been talking about working together in, in a, a, at a country level, but you know, one of the barriers to that will be the institutional egos that we would have to overcome in order to achieve that type of coherence. All right. Um, Thanks, everyone. Now I'm going to throw it out to the floor. Um, because it's the end of the day and I got here at 7.30 this morning, we're going to do three questions at a time. I don't think I can do quite the, the five or six that people are doing earlier. Um, and, and let's try and structure it around those things, around, around what, are, what are the incentives and, and behaviors that we need to fix, and also what's the critical path moving forward, if you have comments. And I'd like to take it, um, sorry, that was loud. <laughs> I'd like to take, um, take that a little, one step further and ask um, if you could talk a little bit about the metrics that your um, particular organizations have for discussing the effectiveness of partnerships and what constitutes success of a partnership. Okay. Susan? Along the lines of partnership evaluation and, and just effectiveness, I'm really curious, are they true partnerships? I mean, when you've got donors often, and Greg, you may have experienced this, it's really difficult for the grantees or the ones accepting the funding to say no or to, to try to tell you this isn't working. And I'd be curious if any of you have experiences of having real conversations about how to work together. One more, um, Dennis. Thank you. Um, it was mentioned that there are large transaction costs with partnerships. And it seems that the, the more effective you want the, the partnership to be, the greater are the transaction costs. In particular, when one wants to work in the field, uh, in, in the communities, it's, partnerships are very difficult to organize and maintain. There are some which are opportunistic. They just come together for a particular solicitation or a grant. There are those which are based on the old boy or the old girl network that people know each other and, and they come together because they know how to work together. And then there are the more formal partnerships which have a, some structure and they ha may have a, a secretariat which costs money to maintain. And I wonder if, if there could be some comment on um, what are the most effective types of partnerships here? I'm particularly interested in working in the field, in, in the actual communities that need, need services. Okay. Um, let's stop with those three for now, and the next time we're going to hit up the left, because I think we got the, the right pretty strongly there. Um, so the first one was, uh, what are the metrics for effectiveness of partnerships? Um, Darren or Katie, one of you want to? I could, I could jump in. Um, I think there's metrics on the activities that you do, and I think that's just like any program. You have activities and you have metrics for those activities, but I think there are metrics that are specifically around the health of the partnership itself. And I mean, for me, the most important thing is, are my partners actively engaged in what we're doing? If I'm not hearing back from them on emails, if I can't get a hold of them on the phone, that's an indication to me that this is not a priority for them. And of course, everybody has a full-time job, but I think the partnership is really most effective when what you're doing is supporting the daily work of that, of all the partners, the things that they're doing, and that they feel that there's so much value coming out of that activity that it's worth spending a little bit of their time and energy. And so I often will gauge that if we 
put out an idea for an activity, everyone's like, yeah, that's a great idea. But if we go down that path of trying to implement it and no one's really getting engaged in it, you know, the fact of the matter is that's really not an activity that we should be doing. So that's, that's one of my metrics. I think within SWA, I mean, the, the, the question is, is, is highly relevant and I don't think we have necessarily a, a, a you know, well-crafted well answer to, to that beyond what, what Katie has already mentioned. We have metrics for certain, certain activities. I think that the, the point I made, which is, is one that we're grappling with, I'll be frank with you, which is, which is around attribution. Um, what we're trying to do is to look, at, to strip out um, activities and outcome outputs and outcomes which could, could have happened irrespective of the partnership and try to focus on those things which occur because one or more or several or many partners have come together uh, to, to bring about a change and uh, you know I'll be frank that's that's extremely challenging uh, I, you know we have a narrative on that lots of qualitative information but nothing that I think would really stand up to the type of rigor that I think the questioner wanted. Uh, over the years, we have um, searched for uh, tools that uh, can be used to measure the health of uh, partnerships. And currently, we're using a tool which uh, is a self-assessment tool, which we have used for probably uh, three or four years, uh, and use it within uh, several partnerships. And it's based on a series of questions which relate to four factors, and one of them I'm blanking on at the moment, but the other three are trust, transparency, and accountability. Since it's a self-assessment tool, what happens is that uh, you know, each organization in the partnership uh, reviews itself at, say, six monthly intervals or whenever, uh, normally whenever we meet as a partnership. What's interesting is that if you look back over three or four years of data, you know, for example, on trust, you can see occasions when either, you know, all the organizations are expressing a drop in trust or one organization is expressing a, a drop in trust. And you can relate that to specific uh, happenings within the partnership. Um, so the way we've used it is as, as sort of partnership managers is to sort of pick up on trends and where we see uh, trust becoming an issue or uh, transparency or accountability, we try to identify, what, okay, what's causing this? And then to do something about, uh, uh, you know, dig into the cause, discuss it openly and uh, try to get through it. It's not perfect and well, it's not a perfect tool and uh, you know, some of our academic uh, colleagues have criticized it as being less than rigorous, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> All right, next question is, um, are they true partnerships? <laughs> Susan, was that the gist of your question? Well, it's more about, have, has anybody really pushed back on one of the other partners, and in particular the donor partner? Ah, okay. I feel like that hap is happening, so um, the nefarious Peter has no problem telling me when he doesn't want to do something, so. <laughs> <laughs> but that's Peter. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I think, I think um, trust is built many times through transparency, but through time. And so I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I feel pretty good about the relationship we have with groups like Care Through Peter and Dennis, Catholic Relief Service, Sean with World Vision, um, and also, you know, seeing, seeing work in the field. So it, it's when there are obvious issues, I had it recently on a recent visit, um, I pointed it out. Everybody could agree that, yeah, things weren't happening that were supposed to be happening. I think we're able to have those frank conversations. And also on the constructive side, I had a visit where I saw amazing, as the Swatch Plus program, how, how, you know, over the years, because I've been doing school programs for so long in Western Kenya, uh, the care water team has really learned how to simple things you think like you know how do you pick the right patron of the water community because you you pick them you know they you know how to screen that they're going to be there longer term and they're not going to be gone six months from now little little things like that that make a big difference so 
Uh, I'm sure there's room for improvement, but I, I, I think we're able to have some pretty, pretty good real conversations. Peter, feel free to disagree with me. <laughs> it's quiet. <laughs> did, we, did anybody else have a comment on that one? Um, the, so the last question that we had, and I'm going to add one more after that, is uh, so we, there was a question about whether field partnerships are somehow qualitatively different and then what, and that the transaction costs can be quite high and, and what, uh, what are the most effective kinds of partnerships that we could be forming in the field um, in terms of achieving results? I find that the implementation partnerships are easier. I don't know, maybe because we have a real specific goal and, and you know, it's a defined project in, and those seem to be a lot easier. The, the ones like um, that Daryl was mentioning, and, and for myself, I've been working more in the international network to promote household water treatment, that, you know, that has uh, about 100 organizations. So there are, there are a lot of transactional costs. It seems to, you know, we gain and lose momentum. Um, but I think that work is also very necessary for, for you know, for, this, for the same reasons that Daryl mentioned. If we're going to really engage governments, that's really tough, slow work, but it's absolutely critical to, um, like Lewis said earlier, Lewis Borstein, to, to reach scale. So we have, to, we have to change government policy, and that just takes long, hard work. I don't know whether Dennis is um referring to field partnerships in terms of partnerships with government or partnerships between um, individual or different NGOs. I think the, with regard to the latter, there is a real struggle about whether you go down the route of having different NGOs with their own piece of work and each piece of work you fit it together into a program or whether you go down the sort of combined team route, which I actually think, uh, my current thinking is that that has uh, significant advantages, but it requires, um, you know, the NGO partners to sort of hand over control and um, for a variety of reasons, there's often a reluctance to do that. In terms of, um, Partnerships with uh, governments, uh, I, you know, we could spend a lot of time discussing that. It, it is, uh, I think it's very challenging. And I, when I look around the room, I know there are people here who you know, have, uh, you know, a lot of experience of, uh, of um, dealing with, you know, partnerships with government. Uh, I have to admit that one of the reasons that I was pleased to work, start working for an NGO was that, you know, with an NGO you can choose how close you're going to get to a government. Um, but I've realized over the years that the reality is that we have to uh, engage very closely with government wherever we are. And, uh, you know, the, being able to operate independently without much contact uh, with government is, is really a myth in terms of um, making progress. Okay, um, let's turn it out for two more questions. We've got about five minutes left. Um, John, and then we'll, then we'll go to you. Yeah, this is, I mean, it, it's all, this is very interesting, but it's also, for me, it's very heavy. And I feel like that's part of the struggle and I think Lewis and Peter, I think both alluded to Lewis in the last session, is that I think part of the struggle and part of this heaviness is, is the goals that we're setting. I think partnerships come together when there's a very clear goal. And I think, you know, even Darren with SWA, I mean, the, the goals are a little bit fuzzy. You know, it's like you want this kind of national buy-in, but you don't really have, you know, it doesn't necessarily trickle down into the district levels. And I think that, you know, and, and the government involvement, all this heavy stuff. So I think, I think maybe we can get beyond the, you know, how do you involve the government? How do you, you know, have a good part, you know, what are the criteria of good partnership by actually setting, as Lewis was saying, you know, don't set the goal on doing the, the borehole pump, but set the goal on the services that last. And I think what we can do as, I mean, we've got enough people in this room, I mean, to actually probably solve I mean, not individually, but working in partner, as partners in partnership with partners in a particular country to solve a country's water problem. 
So why don't we try that out? I mean, I feel like we, we've got to set a goal. I mean, I'm going to say it, you know, everyone forever <laughs> in a particular, per, per particular country. And let's try, let's, and maybe that's really the next step. And maybe that's sort of the, you know, and, and, and Darren, I think, you know, your point of organizational egos is also really critical. And maybe the way around that is, you know, we have a meeting, uh, we talked about this a little bit, with like Chatham House rules or something, where we just kind of say, throw the organizational egos aside and just say, okay, let's do this in X country that's low hanging fruit, and let, in five years, let's get every person access to water and sanitation in that country. And we're, gonna, we're not gonna say it's this methodology, it's this technology, it's this tool. We're just gonna say, let's do it. We'll figure it out along the way. We're, we'll monitor it rigorously. We'll figure out the indicators that work for all of us for that particular context, and we'll just do it. And I mean, I think that, that then I think the partnership roles will come together, and you don't have to have a this partnership, that partnership. The, the integration stuff will come together. You know, it's like the gender stuff will come together. I mean, Ned's been telling this great story, our CEO Ned Breslin, about you know this toilet in Rwanda where he, you know, the, the guy's been, he's go, been going there for the years, uh, for years, and the last time he went, the guy grabbed him, who owns the toilets, who runs the toilets, says, Ned, I gotta show you something. Brings him into this huge toilet, you know, a area, which, you know, you could fit probably a, a you know, a car in, what was it? It was a handicap stall, right? So it was like, this guy developed a handicap stall because he realized that the handicapped people couldn't get there, and he said, Ned, this is, this is my everyone. You know, and I think, no one said, hey, you've got to do, you know, disability access. I mean, that, even though you, some NGO could have gone to him and given him a paper and a policy. No one said that. But because we, we had kind of gotten in his mind that he's got to reach everyone, he figured it out. And that's exactly what we can do with our local partners if, if we all, I think, work together on this broader goal. So to me, that's the next step. So let's do it. <laughs> that's fine. Okay, uh, uh, I like uh, Epita's challenge, asking NGOs to do better or maybe uh, think of uh, disappearing. You know. At the same time, uh, I sol uh, salute uh, the job of the private sector, trying to do it totally. Um, what I'm thinking is that um, uh, the private sector, even uh, those who are using now the what I got, they may not be able to solve the entire problem of the water problem in some of the developing countries. I'll think of uh, one uh, community, for instance, where you had to spend one day just to travel 60 miles and help a community drill uh, 10 boreholes. Six months later, UNSCI was able to repatriate. 10,000 people to that village. I don't think that is the area the private sector wants to go. At the same time, it's good to think about it, not only in water sector, in some other sector most NGOs are working in. I guess the challenge we are having now in water sector will help think. When, it, when I, we take uh, uh, agric agriculture, for instance, you are going to a community for 40 years, the same community is hungry. Every year they are hungry. And then we have to sit down and think, are we doing the right job? I don't think that water sector is doing less than the other sector. The problem here is that we have a sector which is very sensible. If somebody, a community lost, uh, their water system today is very sensible and uh, people can notice very quickly. That's why we are coming back to this. But at the same, it's a very positive we are having now to think about it and do it better. It's just a reflection I have. But private sector coming in now is very good, but I'm not sure if they will be able to function in some, other, uh, some countries where politically it's not possible? Can they go into some of these needy communities we are serving now and be able to help them? Are they able to serve everybody, even including those who do not have money at all, 
to buy the water or buy the water guard. These are some of the teams you have to put together to see how best private sector, NGOs, donors can help to solve this problem. Thank you. I think we're, we're out of time, um, but uh, are there any last comments people want to uh, make on the panel before I wrap it up to respond to anything you just heard? Yeah, in response to John, I think, you know, in, uh, for those of us who have gray hair or um, no hair at all, been around for a bit, um, and what I've seen is that, you know, sort of every, almost every generation has sort of set this goal of uh, full coverage, of sustainable coverage in a country. And, uh, you know, we've, we've uh, set out those goals in the past. We, you know, we set them out in not quite the same goals, but we sort of set out the goal in the eight years of making very significant progress and we failed and we learned from that failure. Uh, I think we, uh, as John is suggesting, have to keep trying it. I don't think necessarily, you know, we're going to uh, succeed this time but it should not be for one to trying. So, you know, I very strongly endorse what John is saying. We need to think about, you know, taking a country and, f and just seeing uh, how it plays out. Because we learn so much more when we get to these uh, higher levels of access and coverage. Because different things happen. There's sort of momentum about the process. And we have all sorts of hypotheses about what will work but it doesn't work now because we don't have enough momentum. If we had more momentum, you know, all these systems that we've been thinking about in terms of maintenance, supply chains, et cetera, would work. So I think there's a lot to be said for tr trying it again and seeing where we get to. Um, we may not be successful, but we will learn a lot from uh, the uh, effort. And I think one thing I've never thought about, but Darren has raised these organizational egos. We really have to get uh, over our organizational egos. Great. I think that's a, that's a good uh, note for us to end on. Now, clearly this is a topic that uh, could use um, several days of discussion, um, but what I encourage people to do is, is to think concretely out of this to have lots of, of hallway conversations and think about how we can start to put together some of these very concrete suggestions we've heard. Um, setting a goal in, in a single country uh, and a, around a large initiative might be one of those. Uh, coming up with um, the kinds of partnerships uh, like, like the Global Hand Washing Partnership that are, that are flexible enough that they can go viral. Um, thinking about starting businesses that uh, and, and I think we, you know, we could have used even more discussion around, around why the, the commercial marketing had some challenges, but thinking about businesses we can start that could also go viral in a, in a commercial sense. Um, but I hope people take the energy out of this and, and take it forward. So I think Ellen's probably past time for me to, uh, to cut me off here, so I'll let her do that. So I just want to quickly, um, if you'll allow me about two minutes of your time, um, I want to thank um, the panelists and Brooks for um, all of their good contributions in the great discussion. Um, and I just wanted to end with two things. Um, I have um, prizes, so I want to see who is paying attention. So I have two questions. The first person to raise your hand gets a prize. Um, you have to answer the question correctly, John. Um, so um, what was the best metaphor that was used for life cycle costing? Susan. <laughs> that was a very good one. That was a great one. Yes, so yes, you get a prize. Um, and then the second one um, is, uh, this is a little bit more difficult, um, and it was barely touched on, but what is the role of advocacy in WASH? Great, great. So you win a prize, come see me afterwards. So I just want to thank um, the, the um, 
the World Bank for um, hosting this today. Um, and um, I wanted to thank all of the panelists and the moderators that put a lot of work in. Um, and also wanted to thank all of the organizers. There was a large group, um, and they're listed on your agenda, who spent a lot of time trying to pull all of this together. So I really want to thank them for their efforts. There was um, over 75 different organizations that were represented throughout the day today. And that says a lot about their interest in the issue, um, in learning more, and also the underlying um, thought of sustainability that comes out um, throughout the conversations during the day today. Um, I just want to um, let you know that this is um, part of a series of different events that are happening um, throughout World Water Day. So happy World Water Day, almost. Um, and so celebrate in whatever way you'd like to tomorrow. But um, I would encourage you to tell anybody and everybody that you see that it's World Water Day and tell them why they should care. Um, and then the, the last thing is that um, the information, so we've been recording these sessions, um, the last couple that have been panel focused, um, and they will be available as well as the contents on the thumb drive in case you didn't get one, um, as well as all of the presentations will be available on sustainablewash.org after, after this is over. Give us a little time to get it up there. Um, and we're going to continue the conversation um, throughout a sustainability webinar series that we started last year and will continue through this year. Um, and so information, again, about that is available on sustainablewash.org. Um, um, the next one will be the beginning of April. Um, so that's all that I have for today. Thank you again to all of the participants for per for participating. Um, and then um, there is an event, if you guys are interested, that will be happening at the Carnegie Institute. Um, John um, Sawyer, who was here earlier, mentioned it's a film on water as part of the Environmental Film Festival at 6 o'clock PM this evening. And if you run really fast, you can make it on time. Uh, John apparently wants to speak because his microphone is on. So I'll, yes, yeah, John. I, I think we all need to give Ellen a very big round of applause. She coordinated this whole day. So you guys will all get um, uh, a notice about Sustainable Wash when the information is up after the fact. And um, I would encourage you to continue these conversations um, with each other from now and forever. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>